Hello, my name is Daryl Robert Chun, and we're here for another program of Dollars and Cents. I would like to open this program by reading um, uh, what I consider one of the first anti-immigration pieces ever in America. The state of Arizona has become a flashpoint for the anti-immigration movement. And I'm reading this not necessarily so much about the immigration issue, but it's about what it says about our country, what it says about the, um, our nation as a whole. Uh, this piece, this anti-immigration piece, was written by a representative of America's first people, Chief Sitting Bull of the Lakota tribe in South Dakota. The Lakota Indians had been promised land of their own by the United States government in a, quote, inviolate treaty. They had been driven off their lands and given the Black Hills in South Dakota to live on. And there they resettled until, of course, gold was discovered. The largest gold mine, homestake mining, was to be mined on the land that had been given to the Indians. The term Indian giver is really ironic because it was the United States government, it was the American people that took away what they constantly had promised the Indians that was theirs. They asked him to move again. And this is what Chief Sitting Bull said. And I, I hope that you all listen to this with your hearts. This is what he, he told this to his, to his fellow Indians. Behold, my brothers, the spring has come. The earth has received the embraces of the sun, and we shall soon see the results of that love. Every seed is awakened, and so has all animal life. It is through this mysterious power that we too have our being and we therefore yield to our neighbors, even our animal neighbors, the same rights as ourselves to inhabit this land. Yet hear me, people, we now have to deal with another race, small and feeble, when our fathers first met them, but now great and overbearing. Strangely enough, they have a mind to till the soil and a love of possessions is a disease with them. These people have made many rules that the rich may break, but the poor may not. They take tithes from the poor and weak to support the rich who rule. They claim this land, they claim this mother of ours, the earth, for their own, and fence their neighbors away. They deface her with their buildings and their refuse. That nation is like a spring freshet that overruns its banks and destroys all who are in its path. We cannot dwell side by side. Only seven years ago, we made a treaty by which we were assured that the Buffalo country should be left to us forever. Now they threaten to take that away from us. My brothers, shall we submit or shall we say to them, first kill me before you take possession of my fatherland? Arizona has become a flashpoint for the anti-immigration movement in America. We forget so quickly what we have done to those who inhabited this land. We forget so quickly the treaties we made and our words that we broke. And now we blame others for our problems that are happening to us. Let me assure you, it is not the Mexicans that are responsible for the terrible economic problems that Americans are now going through. They didn't foreclose in your homes. They didn't make you those loans. They didn't promise you what they could not give. And yet, this nation is now blaming those who are not to blame because they're easy to blame. It will not solve the problem. It is an, they're an easy target. But if you really want to solve something, if you want to improve this nation, if you want a way out of our problems, it's best that we reflect on what the truth is. I'm going to take calls during this talk. But first of all, I would like to read something that came to me in 1992, far before I started looking at the economy, years before I began focusing on issues that were going to become germane. This is 1992. And these words came to me whole cloth. In times of expansion, it is to the hair the prizes go. Quick, risk-taking, and bold, his qualities are exactly suited to the times. In periods of contraction, the tortoise is favored, slow and conservative, quick only to retract his vulnerable head and neck. His is the wisest bet when the slow and sure is preferable to the quick and easy. 
Every so often, however, there comes a time when neither the hare nor the tortoise is the victor. This is when both the bear and the bull have been vanquished, when the pastures upon which the bull once grazed are long gone, and the bear's lair itself lies buried deep beneath the rubble of economic collapse. This is the time of the vulture, for the vulture feeds neither upon the pastures of the bull nor the stored up wealth of the bear. The vulture feeds instead upon the blind ignorance and denial of the ostrich. The time of the vulture is at hand. This is approximately 18 years after those words came to me. And it is clearly now the time of the vulture. It wasn't then, now it is. And Americans are in deep denial about the problems that they're facing. America has been a spendthrift nation ever since the 1970s. In fact, ever since World War II. After World War II, this nation had the largest hoard of gold in history. We had a positive balance of trade with the rest of the world. In the next 20 years, we should have had even more gold. What happened then was by 1971, we had so little gold, we had to shut the gold window. Making all currencies fiat, making all currencies in the whole world pieces of paper. They were no longer exchangeable for anything of value, which was essentially gold and silver. For the first time in the history of the world, for the first time in the history of trade, of global trade, gold and silver were removed as money. And the reason why this happened was that between 1970 and 1971, we had, we spent our gold. We spent it on our overseas uh, military commitments. We spent it on our military bases. We spent it on wars. And by 1971, Fort Knox was empty, virtually empty. We don't know how much gold is there. The United States has refused to audit its public gold holdings ever since 1954. We've been lied to. Every government, Democrat, Republican, has not told the truth. Don't expect this one to. Don't expect the next one to. Um, we look like we have a call here. Hello? Is there anybody here? I guess not. Okay. Yes. Oh, we do have Sherry online one. I just called her off, pulled her off. Is she still there? Okay. I picked her up before you called. Okay. Sorry, Sherry. Um, you can call again. But um, what, what happened is, is that we had to sell our gold to pay what we owed. Because before 1971, if, people, if countries had an excess amount of U.S. dollars, if countries had an excess amount of any currency, they were able to go to that country and exchange that for gold. They would came, come back to the dollar. The dollar was backed by gold. We had an agreement with all of the countries that this would happen. Gold had anchored the international currency system. What happened was when the gold left, countries were free to print. Countries were free to borrow. Countries were free to do anything with the currencies that they wanted to do. Ever since 1970, and starting in 1980 especially, the United States went on a borrowing binge. The United States went on a spending spree. Now, 40 years later, the bill is due and owing. We are the world's largest debtor. We, are the wor we borrow more money in the whole world. 50% of the world's military budget is spent by the U.S. We are bankrupt. We've been for decades. And now it's caught up with us. I think we have a call here. I will take it now. Hello? Is anyone there? Uh, you're talking about the... Yeah. Hello? Yes. You're talking about the collapse of the uh, monetary funding and, and uh, the, you know, the global uh, problems here yes. about uh, how uh, finance is run. Yes. It seems to me that the only thing of value in the future uh, would be water and food. Uh, you know, money, no one's going to care about that if they can't eat. And uh, the, the old axiom, um, you're nine days away from revolution, when people, uh, you know, those nine days, when, when it starts, and people start getting hungry nine days after they can't go shopping or whatever. You know what I mean? We, we are going to have a monetary breakdown, and it may be as dire as you say. And it, it, in fact, it, it, in some areas it probably will be, where it's going to be down to survival. 
But at, at another level, at the level that governments work at, the level that nations work at, they're still going to need trade. They're still going to need to move goods back and forth. It's like during times of war. At the end of World War II, the only supplies that Hitler was able to purchase was through the transfer of gold. And so it is when the monetary system breaks down. It's not something that you and I are going to change with each other. I mean, I'm not going to be able to go if you have a lot of wheat and I'm hungry and, you know, give you my stash of gold. You're going to go, well, you know, I want barter, trade, something like this. So probably at the personal level, it is going to break down to barter. But at the level of commerce, and it's still going to exist at some level, for those who have wealth, and there's a tremendous amount of people that are still holding wealth right now, but they're holding it in, in the form of paper assets. And what they don't realize is that those paper assets are going to become worthless. No paper money regime has ever lasted. And this one isn't going to last either. This regime used to be backed by gold and silver. It is no longer. So you are right. That I agree at, with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At a personal level, it's gold and silver is generally, is, it, silver may be, could be still in circulation, but gold has always been be between governments. What, what my thing about gold is, is that for those who have assets and, and the rich who still believe in paper, and they always have, um, if, they're not in, if, they not, if they haven't moved out of paper into gold, they're really going to be in a lot of trouble when this time comes. So, um, no, I, 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 I agree with you that we're headed for something that most people have never seen before. We're headed for a rendering that's going to be a basically apocalyptic. I, I, you know, and I feel uh, for these large cities, these people are not going to be able to get out of them. No. There's, you, you know, there's a, a, a breakdown of order it is going to happen. It's already happened in Egypt. It already happened in Tunisia. And What's happening in Mexico also. Yeah. I, I, last year in my, in my newsletter, I, I wrote, I said, governments will fall. That's what I said January of last year. I said governments will fall, and, and they will. Governments are falling right now. It's taken a year. Food prices are rising. Last right. year, you know, and that's, what's, that's in the poor countries. This is where the pressure is going to be felt first. Yeah, forget about gasoline, food prices. Food, food prices are soaring. Corn, you know, corn is 94% up over last year. Wheat is up. All I hear, sugar is up. I hear some of these uh, chipper... Uh, you know, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat or anything, but uh, I hear all these um, pundits uh, talking how uh, the people have been better fed, uh, you know, in this, these times. They're, they're better fed than they ever have been, at least in this country, in the U USA. And uh, I just walked down to McDonald's. It cost me seven bucks. You know, I could buy a steak for that, you know. You know, the people who say that, the people who are defending the system, are the ones who are benefiting from it. That's what I feel. It, it's true. And so rather than look at what's so, they will defend the existing order in the face of just outrageous inequities and inequalities. The difference between the rich and the poor in the United States is now greater than any industrialized country. We are approaching a chasm that you, we used to refer to as banana republics. The top 1% of this country like, hold yeah. most of the wealth. Everybody else is basically on capitalistic welfare, which, which means living on credit, credit that they will never be able to pay off, and that's just how the system we have is. There's just, it's, it's, that's what we've come to. So. Okay, so, so a couple questions. Um, uh, you know, to, if you could put it in a nutshell, um, the, uh, you hear so much about the... Uh, uh, types of uh, these economists, they have uh, their, oh, man, I don't remember their, uh, what they call them. One from Switzerland, um, the economy uh, models they follow. Um, I just don't understand, uh, and, and interest of stuff like that, interests of the banks and all these, uh, some of them, uh, some folks say that uh, it comes from the Templars' uh, uh, interest. No. Interest has been around since time immemorial. Right. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. And in fact, the Jewish faith, once a year, all, all debts were wiped out. In China, all debts were paid at the end of the year. Because compounding interest will kill you. And they understood it. May I ask you a question? Yes. Quick, I mean, just to interject, wasn't interest, uh, what, weren't people that... Uh, 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 made money off not working, 
interest uh, looked down upon? They were, they were definitely or? looked down upon. During the Middle Ages, the Catholic uh, loaning money and making money off the loaning of money was termed usury. All right? It was a sin. The Muslim faith outlawed it. Even to this day, they get around it, but it's outlawed by the Muslim faith. The Jewish faith said, well, don't charge interest to other Jews. You can charge it to Goyim, all right? So every major religion had restrictions on interest. What happened to it was this. In 1694 in England, the first central bank was created. Before this time, banks were non-existent. Banks as we know them, which are the very centerpiece of our society, did not exist before 1694. What happened was this. William Patterson came from Scotland. He went to the King of England, and he offered him a deal. He said, if you let us print paper banknotes, which we will back with gold, we will loan you all the money to w wage your wars. So it was war that originally put the banks in business. What the banks did was they had some gold. They had, let's say, half of their paper was backed by gold. How those people made money, they were called money changers, all right, money lenders. They're the Jewish goldsmiths. And what they did was that they made interest loaning out gold and silver. Once they had a bank, these people, these, quote, bankers, for the first time in the, wor in the, in the world, became known as bankers. They made money charging interest on the loaning of paper. Mm. I mean, on the loaning of paper. They used to have to loan gold and silver. Well, credit. Well, it was, yeah. Credit paper didn't exist. Being yeah. credit. It was credit. And the only reason that happened was they got a government to give them the okay and say this piece of paper is as good as money. And so the government of England allowed them to do it. No other country in the world did it. The English did it. This happened in 1694. So the English set in motion the world of modern banking that we see today. The advantage it gave England was extraordinary. England could wage war on credit. No other country could do that. And if you could wage war on credit and pay off and win that war and pay off what you owed, you were home free. And this is why imperialism took off. This is why England became master of the world. England is a crappy little country around this big, sitting off the edge of France in the North Atlantic. In 150 years, England ruled the world because they had unlimited amounts of credit. This worked until the mid-19th century when they ran out of countries to conquer. The last country they conquered and they sucked the wealth out of was India. And they paid off their debts. But after that, England started faltering. The bankers made a very smart move. They realized that their vehicle of wealth, that England, this great country that allowed them to, to be become wealthy by living off the productivity of others, was going down the tubes. So what they did was this. They came to the United States. In 1913, they established a carbon copy of the Bank of England in, in, in the United States called the Federal Reserve Bank, owned by the private bankers. And at that moment, all the U.S. money was issued by a group of private bankers. 90, almost 97 years later, we're flat broke. We borrowed it. Putting, I used to say putting bankers in charge of your economy is like hiring a candy maker to be in charge of your diet. Well, didn't, the, uh, didn't those same bankers try the same thing when Andrew Jackson they did. was president? The Bank of the United States was their first attempt to do it. And they got away with it for a few years. Andrew Jackson came in. He said this would not happen, and he forced them back. And the How United many States, times did this happen? This, this, that happened one time, the Bank of the United States. But even before then, Alexander Hamilton tried to do it. The bankers know the power of issuing paper money as real currencies. Because if they get that power, they will own everybody and everything. Thomas Jefferson said that there was more to fear from private bankers than standing armies. He said, if we allow bankers to issue our currency, we will soon be homeless on the land that is ours. That our, that our fathers conquered. That our fathers conquered. That's it. So uh, here we are it, in 2011. Everybody's bankrupt. Nobody has any money. And we're blaming the Mexicans. Welcome to America. Didn't uh, Abraham Lincoln say he had two enemies, uh, the Confederates uh, in, in my front door and the bankers on my back door? Yes. Um, what do you mean by that? What he meant by, by that is, is that when he went, when the, when the Union was breaking up, 
all right? And he decided that to keep this thing from breaking up, he was going to have to put his armies and march south, okay? And that costs money. We have never had standing armies in the United States until after World War II. We've never had a vast military establishment until World War II. We have the largest military establishment in the world, and we're going bankrupt because of it. Now, what happened is, is that for him to march south, he needed money. And the bankers, the European bankers, were willing to lend him that money, but at such a rate that the United States would become captive to the bankers ever after. So what Lincoln did, he printed greenbacks. He went to paper. He did the same thing that George Washington did during the Revolutionary War. They went to Continentals. Both men realized this would not work in the long term. Both men realized it was a short-term gambit that they had to do to preserve what they wanted to preserve. And after the war, they went back to gold and silver. So we have had a history with paper money. We fought it off for years. In 1913, the bankers took over, and now they own us. They own both political parties. Don't look for help from the Democrats. Don't look for help from the Republicans. The Republicans have always owned the bankers. The Republicans have been the party that the bankers could rely on. But in 1992, Bill Clinton opened the doors to Goldman Sachs, let them in. Robert Rubin came in. They bought the Democrats over. And now they're the backbone of the Democratic Party. They're the, they are defending the Fed. Well, it seems that way uh, by the people they've hired. This Geithner, uh, Geithner and Paulson, they're all that way. Bernanke they're all that way. And Bernanke. It's dirtier than you think. It's it, it, dirtier than you think. It's it, filthy. It is. It seems very scary. I do hear. But now, let's talk about, uh, I mean. I, wait, I have another call. Okay, so, but let me ask you yeah, one quick question. Yeah. Uh, it, would it be local? Shall we deal with it locally or what? I mean, shall we all locally? I think I think you should watch for any alternative and take one that feels good to you. We, we lost our call there. But, uh, no. Uh, this, is, this is nothing that you and I can do about right now. We're, in, we're caught by history. The system is collapsing, all right? It's collapsing. It's going to be dire. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be bigger than anything we've ever gone through. The collapse that is coming is going to make the Great Depression look like a mild recession. We're not only going to have a collapse in demand, we're going to have a collapse in the value of money. So what you do, what I recommend people to do, is if they have assets to move to gold and silver, Keep the faith. Know that we are more than just individuals here afoot. That this is history. That what's going to replace this system is a far better one. So don't lose faith in humanity. Don't lose faith in God. Don't lose faith in, in who we really are. But give up your faith in what you've had faith in. The Democrats, the Republicans, and fiat money. And the answers will, the answers will become obvious to them after that. We don't know. Wait for them to appear. You will know in your heart when something comes up for you to join and to be a part of. Nothing has yet come up. No real alternatives are on the table. Trust me, they will come. They always do. But they always come after the present system starts collapsing. The present system is not going to be changed. The present system is not going to be... It's not going to be, uh, uh, not gonna be worth anything. It's, it's not going to be worth it. And the bankers are doing everything they can to keep it in power. Stand back, protect yourselves. Protect, All you can do is protect yourself. Protect yourself, form communities. We are not, if we go through this alone, we're toast. It, it's we are be a toast. barter community. We're going to need communities. We're going to need each other. That's how it's going to be. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Us, poverty and hard times is going to bring us together. Thank you, sir. Thank you.